Welcome to lecture three. In this lecture, we will quantify the internal energy of a gas and discuss how energy is transferred to and from the gas through work and heat. This lecture will be broken down into four parts. We will first quantify what is the internal energy of a system. This will include defining the first law of thermodynamics, which states that the internal energy of an isolated system is constant. Changes in internal energy are quantified as work and heat, which we will then look into more closely. Finally, we will examine some specific cases when the internal energy changes. To start off our discussion of the internal energy of a gas, let us examine one of the types of energy that particles in motion all have, kinetic energy. The translational kinetic energy of a molecule of a gas is one half times m times the average of the velocity squared. We saw in the previous lecture that the average of the velocity squared is equal to 3RT divided by M, where capital M is the molar mass. So, substituting that into the expression for kinetic energy gives 3 halves times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature, where the Boltzmann constant, K sub B, is equal to 1.380658 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. In this calculation, we use the fact that the mass of a particle divided by its molar mass is equal to 1 over the Avogadro's number, and that the Boltzmann's constant is equal to the gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. This expression gives us the average energy of one particle in a gas. We can use this expression for the total kinetic energy to determine the energy of other motions of molecules. This can be done using the equipartition theorem which states that the energy of a molecule is equally divided among all types of motion or degrees of freedom. There are three n degrees of freedom in any molecule and each contributes one half times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature to the total energy. For a mole of gas, each degree of freedom contributes one half times the gas constant times the temperature because we're multiplying Avogadro's number by the average energy of each degree of freedom, one half kBT. Since Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann's constant is equal to the gas constant R, then we get one half RT. For a mole of a monatomic gas, there are three degrees of freedom, since n is equal to one. These three degrees of freedom represent the x, y, and z directions of the kinetic energy. Hence, the internal energy of a mole of a monatomic gas is one half RT plus one half RT plus one half RT, which is equal to three halves RT. A one atom molecule has no rotational degrees of freedom, since a sphere under rotation has no change, and there are no vibrational degrees of freedom, since each atom isn't connected to anything else to vibrate with. For the other two types of molecules listed here, linear and nonlinear molecules, they have rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom. For a linear molecule, there are only two axes that it can rotate around, which change the position of its parts. Rotation about the center of the linear axis causes no change. Again, the two axes it can rotate around each contribute one half r times t of rotational energy for a total of rt. We have now quantified five degrees of freedom, three translational and two rotational. Since there are three n degrees of freedom, then there are three n minus five remaining as vibrational states. Each vibrational state contributes a kinetic and potential energy component. This means that each vibrational state adds a total of RT. This means that the total contribution is 3n minus 5, the total number of vibrational states, times RT, the total energy of each vibrational state. The nonlinear molecule follows a similar set of logic, only now it can rotate around all three axes, so that there is one extra one half RT of rotational energy. As a result, there's one less vibrational degree of freedom. The total internal energy of a mole of gas is quantified by summing across the row of this table. Energy is quantized. What this means is that for a given degree of freedom, it cannot occupy a state with any value of energy along that continuum. Instead, a degree of freedom is only allowed to have an energy with discrete values. Those values are illustrated by the lines in the figure below. Quantization is a topic that will be covered in more detail in 361b. For this course, it is enough to accept that for each degree of freedom, states can only possess energies that correspond to those indicated by the lines. 
For equipartition to hold, the system must have enough energy to evenly distribute the molecules of the gas between all the states of the different degrees of freedom. As is illustrated, the different degrees of freedom, vibrational, rotational, and translational, all have different gaps between the different states. Translational has by far the smallest gaps, which begin on the order of about 10 to the minus 37 joules, then rotational at about 10 to the minus 23 joules, and then vibrational at 10 to the minus 20 joules. These values are only meant to illustrate the order of magnitude of the spacing. They are not meant to be exact. The order of magnitude of these gaps, however, can be used to estimate the populations of these states. This estimation is calculated using the Boltzmann distribution law. It states that the ratio of the population of two states, n1 and n2, is equal to the exponential of the negative of the difference in energy of the two states divided by the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Remember that for equipartition to hold, the states of all the degrees of freedom must be reasonably equally occupied. Using the Boltzmann distribution law, the occupation of the states are determined below. At 293 degrees Kelvin, a state and the next state above it are equally occupied, since n2 divided by n1 is about 1, meaning that the number of particles in n2 is the same as in n1. However, for the vibrational states, this ratio is only about 0.084, meaning that n2 is much less populated than n1. The interpretation of this result is that at room temperature, equipartition fails in that the energy is only distributed between rotational and translational degrees of freedom. I include translational here because it has an energy separation much smaller than rotation. It is only when we increase the temperature to about 3000 Kelvin that we see the ratio of vibrational occupations start to approach 1. The takeaway message is that only for high temperatures does all three types of degrees of freedom matter when calculating the internal energy. At room temperature, only the translational and rotational degrees of freedom significantly contribute to the total internal energy. Now that we have an understanding of the internal energy of a system, let us now define the first law of thermodynamics. It states that the internal energy of an isolated system is constant. This is closely related to the law of conservation of energy, and this law essentially states that work cannot be done without consuming fuel. The internal energy is denoted by the letter U. When discussing things in the context of the first law of thermodynamics, we focus on the change in internal energy, which is quantified as the work performed plus the heat transferred. It shouldn't be surprising that a change in energy is related to two values that quantify transfers of energy, being work and heat. We need to define several statements in order to fully utilize the first law of thermodynamics. The first thing to define is what a state function is. A state function is a quantity that is path independent. This means that regardless of how you change a system from one state to another, the change in that quantity remains the same. For example, altitude is a state function. If we were going to determine the change in altitude between the summit of a mountain and the base camp, we only need to subtract one from the other. This difference has nothing to do with the route taken to go from the base camp to the summit. We will see many state functions in this course. The first one that we're defining here is internal energy. This means that to find the difference in internal energy, we only need to determine the initial and final internal energies and subtract the two. The process used to change the internal energy is irrelevant. We also need to define where reactions take place. The surroundings is where we make observations from. It also acts as a very large reservoir, absorbing or delivering pressure, volume, heat, and work while remaining unchanged. The system is the part of the world where we have interest, meaning where the chemistry is taking place. There are three types of systems. The first is an open system, which can exchange both energy and matter with the surroundings. The second is a closed system, which can only exchange energy with the surroundings. And finally, an isolated system which cannot exchange energy or matter with the surroundings. Recall that the first law of thermodynamics refers to an isolated system. Finally, we will quantitatively define work and heat. These two quantities represent the transfer of energy between the system and the surroundings. Work, denoted as W, is a transfer of energy that causes or utilizes uniform motion of atoms in the surroundings. It is energy used to cause motion against an opposing force. Heat, denoted as Q, is a transfer of energy that causes or utilizes chaotic motion in the surroundings. 
it is energy in transit as a result of a temperature difference. A note on the sign conventions, work and heat are positive if energy enters the system as work and heat respectively. For heat entering or leaving a system, this has a special name. It is a process is exothermic when the system releases energy and a process is endothermic when the system absorbs energy.